All right. Well, we might have a few more participants who join us in a few minutes, but we're going to start today's webinar. Uh, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Eric Langenbacher. I am the director of the Society, Culture, and Politics program at the American German Institute. There, I got that right. Formerly known as the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. And today, uh, we're bringing together several panelists to talk about changes to the German electoral system and trying to understand what's really going on, uh, the background and the potential consequences of this very momentous um, uh, uh, set of reforms. And our two speakers are first, Boris Herrmann, uh, who grew up in Baden-Baden, which is, you know, um, super nice, uh, actually, and has spent a lot of time around the world in places like Berlin, uh, Seville. He was based in Rio de Janeiro as the Latin America correspondence of the Süddeutsche Zeitung. That was between 2014 and 2019. And now he's based in Berlin, where he covers the events in the Bundestag. And then we also have uh, Sven Siefkin, who's a professor at the Federal University of Applied Administrative Sciences, as well as a fellow at the Institute for Parliamentary Research, IPAR, uh, in Berlin. Uh, he's also the vice chair of the IPSA Research Committee of Legislative Specialists and the editor of the German Journal for Parliamentary Affairs, the Zeitschrift für Parlamentsfragen. Um, he is very widely published and um, also, I would add, a very good friend to the American German Institute and for the study of German politics more general. So I'm gonna um, uh, start today by just providing some of my own kind of introductory thoughts uh, to what's going on and why this matters so much. And I was telling Sven and Boris before that I can't help but be professorial sometimes. Uh, I also teach at uh, Georgetown University. And in my intro to comparative politics, we spend quite a bit of time on electoral systems and their consequences. So for those who haven't had my uh, intro class anytime soon, I just wanna highlight a couple of reasons why electoral systems matter so much. First and foremost, the choice of electoral system is going to affect the number of parties that makes it into a parliamentary body. And it matters immensely if you have a two-party system, a moderate multi-party system, an extreme multi-party system for coalition dynamics, for um, whether you have a single party government or not, and all the consequences that, that flow from that. As a knockout effect, the electoral system is also going to affect both the behavior of parties and voters, right? So in a system that has or is based on proportional representation, every vote counts, and parties and voters are going to behave uh, accordingly. Uh, competitive dynamics uh, amongst parties will also be affected, again, whether it's a two, whether it's a moderate or extreme multi-party system. This will have effects on split ticket voting and everything like that. And this is also to say that first and foremost, the electoral system has a massive effect on the, on the overall legitimacy of the system. Do voters feel that their votes count? Do they feel like it's useful to participate in the system by voting and getting involved in other ways? So I, I can't really begin to say just how important electoral systems actually are. Now, in the German context, Germany has had a pioneering and innovative electoral system up till now, which, as I also point out to my students, has been copied or has inspired reform around the world in places as diverse as Mexico, New Zealand, and uh, Japan. And it's called a mixed member proportional system, where a proportion of the uh, deputies are elected from small territorially compact single member constituencies using single member plurality. And then another portion of deputies is elected through proportional representation. Uh, some of the other interesting idiosyncrasies in Germany, so there's a 5% national electoral threshold, and there are a variety of other kind of small but important tweaks. So for instance, up till now, if somebody wins a constituency in the first vote, as it's, as it's called, they get to keep that constituency. If they get three constituencies, but not 5% of the national vote, uh, they're allowed a number of deputies proportional to their overall share of the vote, whether that's 4%, 4.7%, uh, et cetera. And there are a couple of other things that maybe we can talk about uh, later on, but that's been the German system up till now. I think it's worked really well to engineer a moderate multi-party system with very almost consensual um, uh, 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 centripetal dynamics 
And that has, I think, served the country really well. However, in recent years, there have been a, a variety of trends, a variety of tweaks to the electoral system that have resulted in the situation that we have today. And of course, the most important issue is the size of the German Bundestag. Because of the idiosyncrasies of the German system, including overhanging mandates, that happens when a party wins more constituency seats than they would be entitled to based on their proportional share of the vote. You have overhanging mandates, which have really risen quickly and, and quite high over time. And then since 2013, you have so-called compensatory mandates, which are additional seats that are given to parties to kind of assure a closer vote seat correspondence. That was a change, by the way, that was mandated by the federal constitutional court, which has been a very active player in managing the German electoral system over the decades. So the German parliament with 736 deputies right now is the second largest in the world behind China. And of course, China's parliament is not a real democratically elected parliament. So it really is the largest democratic parliament in the world. It's also quite costly. And I know that people have used or abused this point for various purposes, but it does cost, uh, by some estimates, about an extra billion euros um, to run um, with so many uh, people. There are also other kind of issues as well. So for instance, there is a calculation called the ideal size of parliaments, which stipulates that a ideal parliament would be the cube root of the country's population. And if that were the case, then uh, Germany should have many, many, many fewer uh, deputies uh, right now, maybe 436 instead of the 736. And it's also true that when you have a too large or a too small parliament, there are all sorts of consequences. In the United States, for instance, you have one member of the House of Representatives for every 770,000 Americans. In Germany, with 736 deputies, it's 112,000 voter or people for every kind of Bundestag deputy. So what that means is that means that it's really easy for constituents, for lobbies, and for other groups to kind of get through, get FaceTime, or get heard by a deputy. Whereas in the United States, it's extraordinarily difficult, especially for average citizens, to truly get through to their member uh, of the House of Representatives. So those are the kind of uh, some of the issues that have driven electoral reform, and um, we've had we've had a new law that was actually passed in uh, March of 2023, although it's being challenged by uh, the state of Bavaria and the Christian Social Union, the Bavarian um, a, a conservative party. Uh, it's being challenged at the federal constitutional court, so we'll see what happens. Um, key elements are to cap the size of the Bundestag at 630 members. Currently, its legal minimum has been 598. So this would be larger than before. Um, there will no longer be overhanging or compensatory mandates. They're still gonna have the 5% national threshold and there are a variety of other aspects which our experts will talk about in more detail. And then I should also add that just last week, there was a final report that was issued by the, and this is one of those wonderful German phrases, the Commission to Reform Electoral Law and Modernize Parliamentary Work. And these also have a variety of really potentially far-reaching uh, reforms in them. For instance, extending the term of the Bundestag from four to five years, reducing the voting age to 16. Um, they're trying to achieve some form of gender parity in the parliament, but it seems that there's disagreement about how to achieve that goal. Uh, they also discussed whether there should be term limits for members of the Bundestag also, I think, to uh, no avail but they want to streamline election audits. This is largely generated by the debacle that we saw in Berlin in 2021 with their repeated elections just a few months ago. And they also want to make it easier for Germans living abroad to vote. So this is, at least in, in my kind of professional lifetime, one of the biggest and potentially far-reaching sets of reforms to the basic kind of electoral infrastructure, the basic institutions of the democracy in the Federal Republic of Germany. So um, I think it's vitally important to more deeply understand what's going on. So that's my 
kind of spiel to begin with. And um, I think first we'll hear, we'll hear from Boris Herman. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for having me here. Um, well, I'm, I'm Boris. I'm based in, in Berlin as a political reporter for the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Um, I'm not an expert in the specifics of the electoral system, but I wrote about the political debate that the latest reform provoked. And this is what I try uh, to talk about in the next couple of minutes. Um, as you mentioned, Eric, uh, we in Germany, the constantly growing German Bundestag has a doubtful reputation of being the largest freely elected parliament in the world after, uh, after China. And um, the question is, why is that a problem? Um, uh, you already mentioned some of, the, some of the points. It's a problem in my eyes in two ways. First, it's an operational problem. And second, it's been getting more and more a problem of reputation for the German democratic system. Uh, on, the, on the operational side, uh, the main problem is not only that they literally uh, run out of blue chairs if they continue like this, uh, not to mention the problem with uh, office space, uh, but uh, more, more lawmakers also mean uh, impractical Bundestag and uh, with more speeches, more committees, more initiatives. And it's almost common sense nowadays that at a certain point, the bigger the parliament is, the less effective uh, effective uh, its work will be. So uh, as you all might know in Germany, uh, Germany is a country where uh, we have a lot of specific laws and regulations. And, um, but I always wanted that one of the most important questions of the functioning of a democratic state, namely the electoral system is not regulated in our constitution. The Grundgesetz uh, only mentions five electoral principles. Uh, it said there has, it has to be voted, the election has to be general, direct, free, equal, and secret. And, um, there's also uh, mentioned that the, so far the minimum voting age uh, is 18. And all the other details are determined by a federal law. That's what is written there in our constitution. So basically it tells our lawmakers, deal with that by yourself. And uh, that's in my eyes, the origin of the problem we have to cope with uh, today that our electoral system is part and has always been of the political competition. So <clears throat> uh, in the end, with any new reform, it only got over the years more and more complicated. And the worst thing is the Bundestag still got bigger and bigger. Uh, we are in the 21st election term now, uh, as you mentioned, there has been a sharp increase in overhanging mandates in the 18th election term and an extensive compensation from the 19th uh, election term onward, the so-called compen compensatory seats or Ausgleichsmandate as we call it. Um, in 2021, the Bundestag hit a new record not the first one, but a new record with uh, 736 lawmakers. And um, when uh, Chancellor Scholz's three-party government, the so-called traffic light coalition, uh, took office in the end of 2021, it promised to dare more progress. And this was also meant uh, uh, as for the electors electoral system and it was crystal clear to them that they had to do something for real and um, and so they did uh, in uh, in uh, in my eyes uh, any successful reform of uh, of any electoral system or specifically in the electoral system in Germany has to meet with two major goals uh, first it has to systematically reduce the maximum number of seats in the Bundestag. And second, it, it must avoid it at all costs, the impression that the self-interest of the governing coalition plays a role in that specific uh, reform. So uh, the 
traffic light collision, our government did, in my eyes, a quite good job in the first sense, uh, but a far worse in the second sense. Um, on the technical side, the reform follows, uh, you also mentioned, you already mentioned it, a quite simple, but nevertheless radical idea. Uh, the coalition reduces the overhang and compensation mandates by simply abolishing them. So the first goal actually can be achieved. The Bundestag will have a maximum number of 630 lawmakers. Um, the majorities in the Bundestag over the recent years had never had the courage to do this because this model has a side effect it's no longer guaranteed that every constituency winner will also receive a mandate in the Bundestag. So uh, it was to be expected that this reform in, uh, of that kind would provoke criticism basically from the Christian Socialist Union uh, who in their own <laughs> uh, world view is some sort of a synonym of Bavaria and uh, the CSU reliably wins uh, the majority uh, of the first vote in Bavaria um, over the decades uh, or oh, even though their proportional representation is uh, has been in 2021 less than 40 percent um, so the narrative of the importance of strengthening the personal bond between uh, voters and their local representatives in the Bundestag is particularly uh, popular with CSU politicians. And uh, for instance, the CSU Secretary General Martin Huber accused the coalition of organized electoral fraud. Uh, and. Uh, but this is a debate that the coalition could have quite easily dealt with in my eyes because, it's, because it was until this point obvious, uh, like some sort of a Bavarian narrative. Uh, and uh, even a growing number of uh, deputies belonging to the, their sister pa party, the CDU, had been criticizing the CSU strong opposition to, to any sort of uh, solution in recent years. Um, so at the first glance in early March, uh, in my eyes, the, 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 the electoral reform we're talking about now um, looked like a pretty fair deal that was uh, supposed to kind of cut the chances of all parties equally. Um, and this was yeah, it's meant to be a huge change as in the 16 years of Angela Merkel's government of the uh, two conservative parties had uh, they had only presented reform proposals for kind of their own benefit that has always been criticized in that sense. But now it's uh, for me, uh, one of the most interesting things of what happened and it would have been great to ask Constantine Kula about what actually happened on the last weekend before the this reform has been voted in the Bundestag because on that last week weekend uh, something really strange happened. Uh, a, a few days before the adoption of the new electoral law in the Bundestag, the coalition surprisingly changed its bill in like one essential point. Um, you already mentioned the term. I think you said like the basic mandate clause. We call it the Grundmandatsklausel. All of a sudden, this clause was abolished. Um, it's, I, you, you already explained it, so I don't even uh, give a try if there are any, any further questions later on, we, we try to explain what it's, what it's about. But maybe it, just a, one sentence, if a party fails to reach the 5% threshold, it re but, uh, receives at least three direct mandates, it's still entering the Bundestag and not only with this three guys, but with a number of seats based in their share of the second vote. That's the idea of that basic manning clause. Uh, pretty complicated uh, German stuff. But um, it's important, it's very important because without this passage, the left party would not be sitting in the Bundestag today with 39 deputies. Uh, so for them, it's a matter of their future existence. And um, 
And without this clause, it could also happen that the CSU Bavaria wins all Bavarian constituencies and is not represented in the Bundestag uh, after the next election. So it would be a very good question to ask uh, Konstantin Kruhle, lawmaker of the FDP, why they skipped this a couple of steps before the finishing line of very long process. Uh, because uh, now I come to an end, because the situation, political situation now is uh, completely different. Uh, because all of a sudden, the bill is no longer one that affects all parliamentary groups equally, but it's now looks like a lot it could push two opposition parties out of a parliament. And there are, of course, also arguments in favor of deleting the Grundemannheitsklausel, but to push through such a serious change in a few, a few days before uh, you know, the end of that process seems at least very strange. And the CSU has a good point in arguing that it's just another unfair reform for the benefit of the govern governing coalition. Uh, above all, it provides the head of the CSU, Markus Söder, has to win an election in Bavaria this uh, September with a sort of election campaign present. And even the left party is now somehow on the side of the conservatives, which in my memory has never happened. Uh, and both parties announced that they will be filing a constitutional complaint. So. Um, where because of that fierce criticism, there have been also already a couple of proposals to change the bill again uh, from within the ruling parties. Uh, for uh, instance, uh, Axel, Axel Schäfer, deputy of the SPD, he recommended lowering the 5% threshold to 4% and said this would compensate for some of the negative effects of the electoral reform on the left and the CSU. So, we're in an almost tragical situation, uh, so to say, that uh, they worked so hard and in my eyes quite good on a big reform project. And now it looks like it's going on and on with the next reform of the reform of the reform. And we're kind of in that situation we have always been. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Sven. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Eric, for setting this up and for inviting me. And great to be here. And uh, I, I would pick it um, up from right what uh, Boris was just saying. Um, it's the reform of the reform of the reform. We are where we always have been. The electoral law of Germany was not a law that has been made by grand design. From the beginning, it has been contested. It has been a consequence uh, in the parliamentary council that wrote the constitution after the second world war. This was one of the contested issues and it was a compromise that came out of it. And as Eric uh, rightly mentioned over the years, it has actually grown into a particular way of uh, an electoral system that was unitary in the world for, for a long time. And people looked um, up to it and then started to imitate it in the 1990s and, and take it over. Um, and uh, in 2000, um, uh, I don't remember the, the year, um, the, a book came out by two political scientists, American political scientists, uh, Wattenberg and Shugart, and they, uh, the title is The Best of Both Worlds. Because that is what, uh, by wide acceptance, this electoral system of Germany combines. It's the best of um, uh, the, the majority elections, majority system, and proportional representation merged into one system. The best of proportional representation, obviously, being that all voices are integrated into parliament according to their strength in society. Um, the popular vote, um, as we call it um, in, in the United States. So smaller groups have a chance. And at the same time, the best of the single member districts obviously is personalized representation right there. There is an MP in every district that is directly elected. And therefore, on that district level, on that grassroots level, um, forging a personal relationship, at least they have the opportunity. 
to do that. And we have 299 districts. I got the district map uh, right here. They are, by the way, when I show this to my American students, they look at it in amazement and say, wow, these districts, they are quite round. Uh, where is the gerrymandering? Um, doesn't happen in Germany, another uh, big topic. Um, 299 districts. So that is the best of these both worlds. Um, direct um, personal interaction um, on the district level, at least the opportunity to do that. And relatively, if we compare this to the US Congress, for example, in relatively small districts. But of course, if we compare it to other parliaments, these districts are big compared to Austria, for example. Um, so we're somewhere in the middle in the district size if we look at how many constituents are actually represented by one MP overall. Um, but it's not just the best of two worlds. There's a third world that is coming in. And the third world is the federal um, logic. So what we have in the whole equation is state lists, state party lists. We don't vote based on a national party list, we vote based on a state list. And we also have minority protection for strong regional minorities. That is um, the Grundmandatsklausel that has been mentioned. So we basically have the best of four or five worlds that we try to combine in that system. Um, and the question is now, is what we're seeing right here, is that a fundamental change of that system? Or is it another tweak of the system, as you mentioned it earlier, um, Eric? And I, if I had to decide on these two, I would actually come down on the tweak side. We do not change fundamentally. It is still what we call um, personalized proportional representation. That is underlying the system. We will still have the two votes. First vote um, for a district, and second vote for a district candidate, and second vote for the party list in the state. Federal aspect stays in there, party list stays in there, proportional representation in, stays in there. The stop threshold for fragmentation, the 5% threshold stays in there. But as you mentioned rightly, um, the Grundmandatsklausel um, is going out. Um, so that is a little tweak. And the other little tweak um, is that only those MPs will actually get a mandate if um, there is enough coverage in the state list according to proportional representation. So I've tried to put all of that into a graph here. And um, it usually takes me 45 minutes to explain it. And the graph always looks different. So I'm not going to um, get into that uh, professorial temptation now to, um, to explain it in detail. We can certainly go into the uh, details later on. But this is the current um, electoral system. And this is what happens. The three direct mandates go out. And what happens is down here, we only cover those that actually get proportionality and therefore the overhanging mandates and the compensation mandates go out. But otherwise the system stays intact. Now, um, minor tweaks can have major consequences. And that is exactly the problem um, right here. Um, and especially because it's so visible for two parties, the CSU who has actually not ever been below the threshold, the national threshold of 5%. But they have declined, and they are getting near the 5% threshold. Um, so that is one point. Um, the other one is the Linke, who has been below the 5% threshold, even in the last election, and is only surviving because of the Grundmandatsklausel. Now, it has also survived before when it didn't meet the Grundmandatsklausel. So um, it's not necessarily that this eventually fills a party. Um, but that is uh, a challenge. And it's an interesting question to see, uh, as Eric mentioned, how that happened. And if we want to see how that happened, I think we will have to look a little bit more closely at the process. As you mentioned, the Electoral reform has been on top of the political agenda, well, no, not on top, but has been on the political agenda for the last 10 years um, and, and longer. Um, it actually goes back to an election 
which brought out another little thing, hard to translate. Um, Eric, maybe you can give it a go, the negative Stimmgewicht. Um, that uh, is something that appeared in the 2005 election in Dresden, but I will not open this big uh, box now. It's, uh, it's good for political junkies um, uh, to get into that. But this has, in a way, is the seed of all the uh, changes and all the uh, um, decisions by the Constitutional Court, which eventually led in 2013 to the introduction of the compensation mandates. And the compensation mandates have led to the grow, growth of the Bundestag to be the biggest parliament in the world, at least if you count uh, single chambers only. Now, is that a real problem? Is the parliament really too big? Is it really 1 billion euros? Difficult to say, um, but as was mentioned before, nobody is really contesting it. Um, there has been a, an article in the I have to hold it up because Eric mentioned it, the Zeitschrift für Parlamentsfragen, which by the way, in the last 10 years, I have counted, has had 20 articles on the electoral reform with various suggestions of how things could be done better, more fair, and what the ideal system would be. Only problem is we want all of these things that I mentioned, all the five worlds in there, and all the five worlds, as we all know, we want to optimize five things at the same time, uh, we, often, uh, we often fail. So one article in there a few years ago, um, this was based on data for 2018, um, has looked at the cost and says, this is the quarter of a percent of the federal budget. And if we turn this around, the cost of parliament, uh, for the entire parliament, um, each taxpayer pays 25 euros a year. That is not overly expensive if we, if we put it into that context. And also the arguments that were just made with the blue chairs that are not enough or with the committees that are going getting too big are hard to actually validate if you look more closely. But again, this is another box that I do not want to open because as it was rightly mentioned, there is general consensus that the Bundestag should be smaller. Um, and so with that, and as we want to leave room for discussion, let, us, let me just step back a little bit and look at how this whole process of making that decision has come about and how it was received. As I said, long preparation, then the, the constitutional court decisions that were mentioned, um, the general feeling the Bundestag is too big, something needs to be done. A few presidents of the Bundestag, Norbert Lammert, Wolfgang Schäuble, who actively pushed to get the reform started and it didn't, even, didn't ever work an expert commission that was set into, um, into effect in the last um, legislative term before the election produced an intermediary report. And then in the coalition contract, again, this was put on the agenda and a new expert commission with many overlapping members was um, installed um, and put out its preliminary report last August. And based on that report, um, we quickly, we had quite a dynamic situation at the beginning of the year when the first reading of this reform bill uh, happened in January, just I think two weeks or one week later uh, in the committee phase, a public hearing with um, uh, I think around 10 constitutional scholars. Um, and then another 10 days later, the second and the third reading on that revised bill, which did away with the uh, uh, with the three percent um, bill. So there was quite a speedy process that nobody or not many people expected at the beginning of the year. The question right now for me is: Is this the end of it, or are we in the middle of it? Is this speedy decision that has been made? maybe part of ongoing negotiations and pressure tactics. And might we not see, and Doris has just mentioned that too, um, might we not see a reform of this reform before it even comes into effect? That is my feeling. And that is also how the uh, coming out of the report that has just been, re not, not even released, the final um, session of the commit commission has been held last week with the other issues regarding electoral reform. 
last week. They will be officially submitted, I think, next week to the president of the parliament. But this might all feed into a new round of reforming the reform and then putting it into effect. But at the same time, and this goes to the political parties and the actors and their strategies, um, the union parties are not very much focused on um, consensus on these issues right now, particularly Boris Herrmann just mentioned it, he said it was a present for the Bavarians because it might play out fairly well in the state elections to say, look what the traffic light coalition is doing to us against Bavaria. So it's going to be interesting to follow how this is going on. And I'm sure this is not going to be the last word on electoral reform in Germany right now. All right. Thank you, Sven. So I would ask all of our participants, if you have any questions for the panel, um, please type them into the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And just to give people a little bit of time to, uh, to do that, I, I have a couple of questions as well, and, and, and perhaps comments. First of all, the, um, I think the translation that I've used before is negative voting weight. And my understanding is that what can happen under some um, uh, scenarios is that a voter can vote for their preferred party, but that ex extra vote, just given the complexities of the PR allocation process, can actually lead to fewer seats or at least uh, one uh, uh, less seat, uh, 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 just given the complexities of the of the process. And that's something that the uh, constitutional court has repeatedly kind of flagged and and asked for reforms to. The second thing, which I can't resist noting, is that you know I think that that Boris kind of hinted at this when he mentioned how Germans like their rules, regulations, their Ordnung, right? I love I love the fact that they actually have Ordnung Emta, like a, or, a order office in in places like that. And so the German electoral system is really un-German in that regard, just given how they've kind of stumbled upon what I think was actually a very high functioning system. And I think, Sven, you, you mentioned that at this um, uh, parliamentary council when they were coming up with the basic law, wasn't it that the, the, the British occupying authorities wanted a system like the House of Commons uh, based on single member plurality and um, others didn't? So their compromise was just to split the difference. Half would be that, half would be kind of PR. So I don't know, I, I think that's really quite ironic and wonderfully out of character for what we usually associate with the German system. But I do have one very kind of specific question um, because I just, I, I can't understand how this would work in practice. So let's take two scenarios for the CSU, right? I mean, it's possible that the CSU could win all, are there 45 constituencies in Bavaria? They could win all of those constituencies, but be below the 5% national threshold and so, and that would mean that there would be zero CSU deputies, but then they would also have no representation from like any constituency representation. So the larger question is, I mean, even for the left party, right? So they, what do they have? They have like three or four constituencies in uh, Eastern uh, Germany. Um, so that would mean that there just wouldn't be any constituency representatives in those um, districts. Or would like the person who came in second then be elected? I'm I'm not quite understanding how that would work. You know, Eric, um, <laughs> I've been the day after the uh, they they presented the like uh, um, the the reform, the revised reform to a couple of. Uh, to a couple of journalists in Berlin, I've been there uh, in a in a in a meeting, uh, background meeting with a couple of lawmakers from the uh, coalition. And uh, after about half an hour, a colleague from another newspaper came up with exactly that question uh, that you just put. And then there was some sort of a a minute of uh, silence, and then they. Uh, they looked in their papers and said, yeah, obviously that's, that might be the case. So what I suppose is that it, um, it's not a kind of a, a mean thing and an intentional thing to, uh, to 
could like the two oppositional parties uh, kick them out, and uh, because uh, they they wanted to they wanted to do a reform that uh, that would last for for at least a decade or, or longer. So I think it's uh, it's some sort of a mistake, um, and um, and it just uh, took half half a day even for the conservative parties to uh, kind of realize this threat on the one hand and outside the kind of the present that's in it. So I think that's, uh, as you said, it's, it's, it's been getting more and more complicated and with, uh, with, all these, uh, uh, with all these things they had to think about in the last weekend, uh, they just kind of think, I think they did a terrible mistake. That's, that's what I think. Yeah, and if I um, if I may add to that, um, there was certainly a, a strong dynamic in there. And what um, we hear and also read from some journalists is it was clear at that stage. And I'm not now talking about this particular uh, committee phase that was mentioned before. So the time between the first and the second and third reading when the final decision was made, um, how what happened that the three direct mandates uh, went overboard. It was clear at that stage that this electoral law would not be a compromise solution. There had been attempts, there had been background talking, high level background talking with the CDU behind closed doors. And at times MPs, I mean, I'm now trusting, I don't have deep insights, I'm trusting media reports, but there was hope to come to a common um, common uh, um, law um, with broad support or broader support. But it became obvious that this was not going to be the case. Um, and so it was also obvious that a constitutional court challenge would eventually happen. And for that reason, the constitutional court has continually stressed the proportional character of the system has put a strong focus on the equality of the votes based on the constitution. And Boas has just earlier read them out. There is not much detail in the constitution, but um, the equal uh, counting of the votes. Um, so proportional representation guarantees that much better. The introduction of the compensation mandates was based on exactly that. Now the idea and the thinking apparently was, and probably without overseeing all the consequences, um, if we move this system one step further to proportional representation and take out these three direct mandate clause, then we are more safe in front of the constitutional court because the argument is gonna be clearer. It fits with what the constitutional court has said before. Um, on the topic of the districts without representation, then um, this is, of course, as you as you say, technically possible, but it could only happen if people were voting really strange in Bavaria. Uh, if they would all vote with a first vote for a CSU candidate and with a second vote for the Green Party. Such a thing is hypothetically possible, but it's completely unrealistic. But still, of course, um, it, it could happen. The, the next question that you were asking, Eric, what happens to those districts then? Well, the new system doesn't have the direct mandates anymore. The new system goes through the proportional representation. The district vote goes to choose the person that will be on top of the party list. So basically, whoever gets the most votes in a district jumps to the top of the party list. Um, and if there are more people who are jumping to the top of the list and the party has seats in the parliament on that state list, then those with the lowest um, number of or share of votes uh, will not get a seat. But we don't have in that new logic, we don't have the direct mandates uh, anymore. We have the personalization of the proportional representation, um, which in a way we, we had before. That's really fascinating. It, it just struck me, I can't believe I didn't realize this before, but it seems like 
what they are proposing is a version of the open list system used in proportional representation. I mean, not used by a lot of different countries, but in Finland, for instance, where voters can both choose a party and through their 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 preferences kind of help to rank order the deputies as well. That's a, that's a great, very interesting insight. Now, we have lots of questions that have come in and I'm a little worried about time. So maybe I will bundle them also so that we can uh, maximize our, our, our time with our panelists as well. So the first, and this picks up on things that you both were saying, about the constitutional court, uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Do you think that they will um, uh, endorse the Bavarian argument, or do you think they will let this um, go? And then the other question is: so, and how is the public kind of reacting to all these uh, potential changes, or is it just, you know, so technical that the public doesn't really have? attitudes on the whole thing, the whole kind of like issue of uh, non-attitudes, but are people feeling more disenfranchised by these potential reforms? Is it helping to erode trust uh, in uh, the political system? So just some thoughts on the public opinion angle, please. Maybe maybe I ask you to the second one and uh, so into the first one. Um, uh, as far as I, um, as far as I realized, it, it, the, there is a difference still between the public reaction in Bavaria and in the rest of the country, but uh, it gives the obvious tactical arguments of the of Marcus Söder and the CSU in during the election uh, election campaign a far better you know a, a, a far stronger argument what what has happened so. Um, I think uh, public reaction in within Bavaria has been really bad, and uh, apart from that, uh, because you know the, the, the whole uh, uh, argumentation is uh, has ever have been that we are the strongest one, uh, strongest econ economy within Germany, but uh, like in, in Berlin they do. They do all the different uh, tactical things to, to 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 keep us off the, uh, the the money and the infrastructure and whatever. And now they want to kick us out of the uh, parliament. So it's um, it's uh, it's of course a populistical uh, thing because they had uh, within the coalition of the two conservative parties in Angela Merkel's years, uh, they had at least 16 years to, to deal with it and to, to come up with a fair reform, which they never did because they thought of their own benefit. So um, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I think. But it's the most, uh, it's, uh, the election in Bavaria is the most important election, uh, state election in Bavaria this year in Germany. So it's, uh, it's a very important thing, uh, the public opinion uh, over there, and that um, that might be the Bavarian uh, perspective, um, which which I don't doubt. I also looked um, a little bit for uh, poll data, polling data, and there's not too much about it. Um, before uh, there was a poll conducted in January, a general population poll, but as you can imagine, questions about electoral reform very much depend on the question uh, wording. So in that uh, January poll, there was um, an 80% uh, majority that favored uh, the limitation of the Bundestag to 589 members to its original size. Um, and um, in March, again, another poll, a Forza poll, um, said that 64% well, thought that the Bundestag will work better with six, 630 members with a new size than with the current size. Um, and even almost 60% of those people that were surveyed in that national poll were saying they don't mind uh, if not every directly elected MP actually gets a seat in parliament. So this emotional attachment to this system isn't that um, strong, but the same poll also found out that if they were asking, do you support the electoral reform, yes or no, 46% came out against the reform and 43% came out for it. So kind of split. But if I'm looking at public discussion that is going on, 
this is not a an issue that people pay a whole lot of attention to. It's not on the top of the agenda. Maybe Bavaria is a little bit different because of that particular situation, but um, that is uh, that is the question. Uh, how relevant is it um, to a broader audience, especially if you can put that frame on it, which is done. We want to limit parliament. We want to um, save money. We want to make better decisions who could be for it. And if we get into the technicalities, um, then it gets complicated. So um, I'm, I'm not sure there is no major upheaval um, against this in society. At least I don't see it. At the same time, as, as you were saying, fitting with political culture, people will prefer um, something that is not contested, something consensual. Um, so that demand is, uh, is certainly generally there, but this is not a, uh, an issue of high um, public uh, attention right now. Eric, you had mentioned in a second question that I forgot now. How, how you think the constitutional court might uh, rule uh, on this matter? And that, of course, is a good question for constitutional scholars. And as I mentioned, in that uh, hearing, in that public hearing, there were nine constitutional scholars and one mathematician and no political scientist. Um, and the constitu and one of my colleagues here at the university uh, was, was one of the experts there. And um, well, half of the constitutional scholars came out clearly arguing this is against the constitution and the other half came out um, uh, arguing this is in line with the constitution. So what is the constitutional court going to do? Um, don't ask me. Um, let's let's wait and see. Well, I, I just want I just want to add one detail, which I think is also kind of pretty German. That uh, the Constitutional Court a couple of weeks ago, a, they were kind of uh, deciding dealing with the electoral reform, but not the one we're talking about, but the reform before from the year of two thousand twenty, from uh, like the old one that um, and uh, the, the, the parties who filed the constitutional complaint against this reform are now part of the, of the government, the FDP and the Green Party, uh, along with the uh, Linke, which is, uh, you know, apart from it, but that's how fast we go with this kind of uh, decisions uh, in Germany. Uh, that's um, ironic indeed. Um, so we also have a question here about the uh, a new term limit. If they do increase the term to uh, five years, how is this going to impact state elections? Will there be more state elections that align with the uh, Bundestag election? And how might this affect citizen engagement, uh, turnout rates, et cetera? In fact, that, that's a good question. I bet you, I bet you Sven has a paper that he, he wrote on this at one point, or at least has come across. Do we see differences in turnout for regional elections if they align with the Bundestag election or not, or at least if they're in the same year as the Bundestag election? I don't have the numbers there, but yes, definitely. Uh, if you have an election that is held on the same day as a Bundestag election, and whenever these are in close proximity, of course, for organizational reasons, you try to do that to save money. Um, and usually that works well, unless it's Berlin, um, then um, uh, there is higher turnout. Um, but um, we also, there has occasionally been the suggestion, why don't we fix all the elections to each other, that we always have election day and then all the elections are held on one day. But that obviously doesn't work in a parliamentary system where uh, elections can actually, can be early elections in one state and not in another. So even if we would do it at one point of time and um, if it would make sense, um, it would at some point of time uh, fall apart. And there are many other reasons um, uh, not to do that. So I don't think that there is going to be a huge impact, uh, even though personally I'm not in favor of the five year uh, period because it makes the, um, uh, well, it makes the, the, the uh, re election time longer. Um, and um, at the same time, on the state level, we do have these five year periods um, in most of the states uh, by now. Um, but that is now, for the moment, a suggestion by the Commission 
And whether that comes um, uh, into effect, it does look like it because there is general support uh, also from the CDU, by the way. Um, but uh, that is still a few steps uh, too early to say. All right, well, we are almost out of time. So maybe we'll have some kind of final comments. At least I have some final comments that I want to make. Uh, I really want to go back to this issue of how the Germans have kind of stumbled upon, have, have continued to reform their reforms and their reforms and tweak the system to get to where we are today. Because uh, I remember reading somewhere that even the Grundmandatsklausel, right, this uh, basic um, uh, uh, mandate clause, was a, a kind of afterthought that was introduced at one point in the 1950s, I think really pushed by Adenauer to help his small coalition partner that eventually ceased to exist, the German party. So it's it's kind of interesting that, that this was also not part of the original vision of the system as well. Uh, the second point, also something that I read somewhere, is that, you know, the Bavarians have been such um, a, a spanner in the works, and they've basically vetoed any kind of meaningful reform for a long time. But as some constitutional scholars have pointed out, you know, there, 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 there's no, there's nothing constitutional about allowing or having a system that will benefit one party or even allow one party to survive. Like that's not a, a, a constitutional prerogative. So they also seem to think that the Bavarians might not have um, you know, too many legs to stand on in front of the constitutional court. And Boris, I really, really liked your, your point, I have to say, about how doing nothing, which is what, you know, happened in the Merkel years, for the most part, doing nothing is also a form of self-interest. So that it's, it's, it's quite ironic, if not hypocritical, for the Bavarians to say, oh, you're making these changes that will um, affect us out of self-interest when they vetoed any changes for so long out of their own kind of self-interest. So that's kind of a, an in in interesting argument. But uh, maybe some final thoughts, uh, Boris, maybe starting with you. Yeah, in the end, I, I, I just want to make a point that maybe uh, with which I, I come a little bit closer to what uh, Sven Sifkan has been saying. Um, I, I also want to mention that, of course, we are, there is a common sense that the Bundestag had been growing too big. But, you know, on the other hand, they're here to control the government and its institutions. And uh, if we start counting all the members uh, of, of, of these governmental institutions we have, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, Bundesbehörden institutions that most Germans have never heard of and have more uh, members uh, than the German Bundestag has. So it's also it's also been a always a kind of a populistical uh, thing to, to to you know to to focus uh, uh, with all the like the, the the oversized Bundestag only on the on the mere parliament. And I also want to say uh, that it's. Um, you know, it's simply just um, part of the new reality. I mean, no one uh, wanted intentionally to be to, to have a, such a big parliament, but it's also like the outcome of a you know um, diversification of the political will in the country. Because um, in the old days, uh, like the simple reality. And we, we, we never had to uh, a big problem uh, uh, we, we, that old system that used to be good as uh, as you said and uh, and even ex export uh, uh, wonder because it was so simple there were the two big ruling parties and the, there's a small yellow one that jumped uh, every now and then from one to each other in order to form a government but now we have a, a big diversification in our political will and we have six parties and this is also the outcome of uh, of of that and yeah as you mentioned uh, Sven Sifkin is um, there are more and more people who vote with their first vote for a conservative party and uh, with their second vote for another one so this is part of what happened and and Sven? Yeah, and I and I think that is um, that is uh, exactly the way to to finish this. Uh, and and one of the reasons why one can also be 
being skeptical about putting all of this into the constitution and thereby fixing it, um, the system has been uh, slightly dynamic in the past. It has had its adjustments. There has been debate about it. There have been, um, it's, it's not the first time that a, a small majority makes changes to the constitutional law. Also the last decisions were made by small majorities and not by oversized or two thirds um, majorities. At the same time, I think that some of the politics about it is unfortunate. The style of the political debate is um, unfortunate and doesn't resonate very well with um, German political culture. Um, yet it doesn't resonate that much at all. So it's not perceived so much. So it doesn't do a lot of uh, damage there. But as I said earlier, my feeling is that this is not the end of it. There might be a few more rounds um, of reforming the reform um, until we have a final reform. And that might perhaps be one that is jointly done. Or if the worst comes to the worst, there will be a constitutional court decision. And if that happens, we will also have, in a way, peace because as we know from all opinion surveys in Germany, trust in Germany is highest in the constitutional court. So they will have the final word um, and until something happens and the system will remain a bit dynamic. All right, well, we went just a little over time, but this was, uh, I think a terrific discussion and analysis of, of what's going on. So let me thank uh, Sven and Boris for the, taking the time to be with the American German Institute today. And let me tell our uh, participants that we have another webinar coming up uh, next Monday, May 8th, and that is with uh, Dr. Andrew Port, who's uh, in the history department at Wayne State University, where he will talk about his new book, which is called Never Again, Germans and Genocide After the Holocaust. So please look for our upcoming events, and we look forward to seeing everybody again. Thank you, and bye.